morning, church. Great to see you here this morning. All right, let me ask you a question. What food do you think of first when you hear the word Thanksgiving? Okay, I did not expect that. <laughs> I thought for sure you would say turkey, but some of you said, what, Krispy Kreme? What was that? Maybe that's true. That's good. That's good. Every time Thanksgiving rolls around, inevitably, somebody posts on social media the classic turkey drop from WKRP. Does anybody remember this, this show during the glorious 70s and early 80s? Yes, I see that hand. Yes. If you're not familiar with it, it's a classic story. You got Les Nesman, the, the naive uh, weatherman here on the top left, and you got the bumbling station manager on the top back right. His name's uh, what, Carlson? Arthur Carlson. And he's the bumbling station manager. If you're unfamiliar with the, with the, with the radio station, it's always in trouble and trying to raise money. And uh, the, for whatever reason, during Thanksgiving, the station manager thought it would be a good idea to promote the station by renting a helicopter and dropping something from the helicopter that usually it's money, something people would like, or t-shirts, but not these guys. <laughs> these guys thought because it was Thanksgiving, it would be a great idea to drop turkeys from a helicopter. And it is hysterical because at the end of the episode, you see the station manager come in covered with feathers and with all sincerity, he says, as God is my witness, I thought turkeys could fly. I am so sorry. <laughs> which led to the famous and one and only, one and done, turkey drop. And it was, they were cascading and coming down like wet bags of cement. You were hearing this stuff, and it was mass hysteria, and it was terror. And it was wonderful, but no turkeys were harmed in the filming of this, so don't, don't send PETA my way or anything. This is kind of the, the green light that it's Thanksgiving season, and I want to look at probably one of the most famous passages in the scriptures about Thanksgiving. It's an awesome story. You can turn to it if you want and hold your place there. It's in Luke chapter 17. And every time I study Luke 17, this passage, I find something new, like some hidden truth grenades, like some hidden gems and stuff. No matter how many times I've read it, there's always some new truth that seems to come out. So I hope you will see some of these fresh revelations here that God is giving us. Luke 17, we're going to start here in verse 11. Read with me. It says, now, as it happened... He went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Okay, so he's on the border here. Then, as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them... When he saw that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice glorified God, and he fell down on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Oh, and he was a Samaritan. Why did he say that? that you might as well say he was an Auburn fan. That is, how, that is how, yeah, we'll come back to that. Verse 17, keep reading. So Jesus answered and said, wait, were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? And were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this Auburn fan? And he said to him, arise, go your way, your faith has made you well. Y'all, there's so much going on in this. This is one of the most deep passages of scripture you could examine. Jesus encounters 10 lepers. We see they begin to lift up their voices. They call out to him for mercy. And evidently Jesus stops and he speaks to them. Now, we know how the story ends because we just read it, but there's still one part of this story that always surprises me. Every time I read it, all 10 of them were healed, and nine of them immediately rush off. Maybe they're going to something good. Maybe they're going to see their family. You know, they haven't been able to see them in a while. Maybe they're going to see their, their fiance. They had to put the wedding on hold, or maybe they got a newborn child. It doesn't say. What it does say is that only one of the 10 returned to give him thanks. Only one went back. So Jesus asked a very odd question, a very revealing question. Were there not ten cleansed? Where's the other nine? Where's the other nine? What's going on? In fact, they actually made a movie about this. This is a movie with George Clooney that uh, came out. You might remember this. Where, oh, lepers, where art thou? This is a true, a true story. And they're looking 
Where are the leopards? You remember Dapper Dan for the pomade? When Jesus, it's almost like he, he channels this, this mathematical oddity, like, where's the nine? I don't understand what's happening. So here's the question that leads us today. How is our gratitude when God blesses us? Do we stop and truly say thanks? Or do we take the easy road and disappear with the nine? Taking his blessings so for granted. And y'all, it is easy to do. I love how Jesus just cuts through all the noise and with one simple question, he zeroes in on what matters. Where's the nine? And I love how Luke records these are isolated lepers and they immediately jump up. They took action. It says they got up, lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. Okay, so right out of the block, we see a huge truth. Your first truth today is this. If we don't get up, we might miss the master. Right? If we stay seated, we might miss the savior. If we don't get up and do what God is asking us to do, we have a chance to have the master pass us by. See, this phrase, they lifted up their voices, this means that they were literally shouting to Jesus. I don't know about you, but I don't enjoy being shouted at. But Jesus does something here. It's so unique. I want to ask the first question here, why were they shouting at Jesus? You know, why did they just go up and go, hey, man, I heard you can heal. What's up? You want to heal me? He could have done that. Oh, but for one small reason. They had leprosy. Now, leprosy is not terribly common in Apex, so maybe you're not familiar with that. Y'all, it was like giving a death sentence, a slow, agonizing death sentence. If you, if you haven't studied that, we, we looked into this years ago, and if, if you missed it or you've joined the church since then, let me just say it was the worst news you could get. The Mosaic law required that the minute you were diagnosed with leprosy, your life was over. You had to leave town. You had to go isolate yourself with a bunch of scary people, probably in a cave somewhere far away. You weren't even allowed back into the city. In fact, you couldn't even come within six feet of another human once you were diagnosed. with. Oh, and if the wind was blowing, you couldn't come within 50 yards of another human the rest of your life. And if you happen to be walking down a lonely road and a person who didn't have leprosy would stumble upon your path, inadvertently or unmistakably, you know, not, not knowing you were there, the leper was literally required to shout out a word of warning. Anybody know the word? Unclean! Unclean! Can you imagine the humiliation? Can you imagine the isolation and the loneliness? Unclean! Unclean! And their appearance, it was frightening. See, leprosy began to attack the facial features in the extremities first, and then it moved on from there. And it was a slow, lonely, agonizing death. Right? So when you think of these 10 men here in our story, they don't just have a cold. Right? They don't just have COVID. They are desperate for healing. Their life is over. They haven't seen their family. They, they, they knew this was their one chance. And when they heard the rumor that Jesus was passing by, they're at a respectful distance. They're yelling to him. No wonder they got up and they're calling out for mercy. Jesus, Lord, please have mercy on me. I find it interesting that they could have asked him for anything. Jesus, food. They didn't cry out for that. They didn't cry out for shelter. They didn't cry out for higher wages. They didn't cry out to be called by their favorite pronouns. Their need was deeper than that. Their need was at their core. Their need was Ever felt like that? It's Thanksgiving. And inevitably, on TV, you always see one of my favorite Thanksgiving movies, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. The TV edited version, by the way, so you don't have the airport scene where he gets really mad. But if you're unfamiliar with this, Steve Martin is desperately trying to get home. And everything, I mean everything, is going wrong. It's Murphy's Law in action. If anything can go wrong, it will. He's tried planes, gotten bumped, trains, automobiles, everything's broken down, caught fire. He has to spend night after night with this strange man who, bless his heart, means well, but he's the devil. He just torments him. He doesn't mean to. And finally, at his wit's end, Steve Martin is checking in a hotel. He's out of money. His credit cards have been burned up, and he's paying with his watch in $7. And he looks at the night shift manager and says, please, sir, have mercy. I've been wearing the same underclothes since last Tuesday. 
You ever felt like that, where you just needed mercy? Where everything has gone wrong, and it's just like, what now? What next? That's where they were. These lepers needed a torrential downpour, wheelbarrowfuls of mercy drenched on them. Maybe you're there too. Maybe you've had the week from Hades, or the year, <laughs> or two years. Maybe you feel like you're sitting beside the road, and Jesus is walking by, and you're kind of wondering, should I get up? Should I? I've never really called out to him before. I don't even know how to do that. Relax. You're in the right place. Jesus is still walking by. But if you don't get up, you might miss the master. You might miss a very special moment. In fact, you might miss the miracle as he walks by. Okay, so looking at this, the ten lepers get up, but we see next, they don't just stand there, they go out. Keep reading. Christ says this. He says, go, show yourselves to the priests. There's more hidden gold right here. You want some, you want some hidden truth grenades? This is incredible. And maybe you've missed it all these years like I have. Why did they have to go do this? Now think about this. Jesus could have healed them instantly. He could have done that. When Jesus spoke these words, remember, they hadn't been healed yet. The healing doesn't happen until the next verse. So Jesus is telling these lepers who know they can't go anywhere in town, hey, I want you to go show yourselves to the priest. And they're like, wait, what? How could We can't show ourselves to the priest. We can't even go near the temple. They will stone us. And Jesus says, no, no, go show yourselves to the priest. And they're like, okay. And they took this incredible step of faith. See, this is, this is so amazing to me. Why, have to, why are they going to show themselves at all? Why not just accept the healing? You ever wonder that? Back in those days, anytime a leper was healed, they were required by law to show themselves to a priest. The priest would examine them. And then, and only then, if the priest agreed they were healed, they would be given this certificate of release. It was literally a seal of approval, right? It was one of these things that if you did not have this, you would not be declared free of the disease, right? You literally had to have this so that you could leave the cave and rejoin society, right? This was your stamp of approval. But here's something else hidden here. Why do they have to show themselves to the priests? Why not a doctor? You ever think about that? Luke, who's, who's writing this, he's the one who recorded it. Luke was a doctor. And I find it odd that Luke didn't say, hey, uh, you need to go, what about the physician? You need to have our sign off on this. This is so incredible. I think because Jesus told these 10 men to show themselves specifically to priests, these 10 men, most scholars believe, were Jews. Oh, that is, except one, the Samaritan. Now, if this doesn't set off alarm bells in your head yet, it will in just a minute. Look what happens next. Scripture goes on to say, Jesus says, go, they went, and as they went, they were cleansed. Did you catch it? They walked, they took a step in faith, and that is when, in obedience, that is when the healing came. Oh, this is so good. They took action, church. You got that? They got the word from Jesus, go, do this. They had a choice. They could say no, or they could go. And they obeyed. So you know I got to ask, how about you? How about us? When Jesus says, go, are we obedient? When that Holy Spirit, that still small voice, tugs at our heart and says, I need you to go do this. I need you to go bless that person. I need you to serve here. I need you to give this. I need you to go talk to that neighbor about Jesus. When the Holy Spirit tugs, hey, will we obey? Because they did. Their faith was amazing. This is something so, so deep. And that's our next lesson. When they stepped out in faith and obeyed, that is when the miracle happened. It's when they stepped out in faith. Jesus could have done it right there, standing still. But he said, go, show yourself. And it's as they were obedient, as they went. Now think about this. All they had was Christ's command. That's it. They'd never met him before. There's no indication that they were out of the leper colony and went to a few revivals with him. This is a one time they see him and Jesus says, go do this. And they go do it. All they had was his word and the promise that it held. Yet all 10 of them walk in faith and obedience. Would we? Don't think about this as just some Sumerian thing way back when. Think about this today. Is his word alone enough to motivate us to action? Can the Holy Spirit quietly just whisper to you, do this? 
and you obey. And that's the kind of faith I want. Think about your life. Before any great moving, before any great miraculous event, it always begins with a holy tug. With him saying, I want you to do this. The Holy Spirit says, I want you to help somebody. I want you to give something. And then it's up to us to be obedient. Right? All we have is that prompting. Yeah. But that should be all we need. As our Heavenly Father tells us as sons and daughters, will you be obedient? My dad's here today. First time in five years. He's sitting right here. If he, as my father, were to say, son, I want you to go do this, I'd like to think I would still be obedient. And just like that, if I were to tell my son, Milo, I need you to go do this, I would like to think he would be obedient and he would do what his father asked. Is it any different when our Heavenly Father needs us to do something? How many times we say we hear, ah, God, I can't do that. That's, I can't, it's too much. It's too much, it's too cold, it's too hot. The lake's calling my name. I can't do that. It's too expensive. On and on. We have a million excuses, right? Sacrifice is too great. We're telling the father who sent his son to die on a cross, bearing our sin, it's too much. You think about that? Let these lepers' faith move you to obedience. There's something that's amazing to me. It says, as they went. They weren't healed before they went. They don't have been like, woohoo, let's go to the temple and get our certificate of release. It wasn't afterward. It was as they went, these lepers, they get up, they go out, and this reveals their incredible faith. Right? So let me ask you a wild question. Had they not gone to the temple to show themselves to the priests, do you think they would have been healed? No. Mm, bingo. Think about this. Think about their act of obedience. This is our next huge lesson this morning. If we're not obedient to his prompting, if we're not obedient to his word, we just might miss the miracle that he has for us. When we neglect to be obedient, we follow through with what the Holy Spirit is leading us to do. These 10 men, they were all lepers, they cry out to Jesus for mercy. They all get up, they all go out, but from here on out, their roads diverge. This is where the similarity ends, okay? Something happens. I want you to picture this. You're walking with them, you're going along the road, you're talking to these 10 people that you've been forced to be around, and all of a sudden, someone says, whoa, 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 look at your hand. Look at your nose. Your nose is back. Look, look, look at it. Show. We're being healed. With every step closer to the temple, they're getting more and more healed. And they're starting to jump, and they're hugging each other, and the tears are flowing, and their chest bumping, and it is the best day of their life. And you have them saying, I can't believe this. I've got to go home. My wife hasn't seen me in months. And I can't wait to hug her and tell her I'm clean. And another one says, you know what? I had leprosy only a few months ago, but... I'm told I have a newborn son, and I've never been able to hold him. And I get to hold him. Maybe a younger one, probably a teenager, says, I can go shopping. I can go back to the market. I've got an iPhone 13. It's so out of date. i got to get a 14 update. And they're gone, just like that. All nine of them. All of them. Legitimate reasons. No one's judging them. All of them leave except one. Only one came back. This one man who now stood alone in the road likely also had a family he wanted to see. This one man probably had a job, a career that he put on hold. He had a wife he's been missing terribly. Kids, maybe grandkids. Scripture doesn't say. It doesn't even give us that because there's an even more important lesson in this moment. The most urgent and pressing thing he felt compelled to do was go back to Jesus and say, thank you. Thank you. And he doesn't just go up and whisper it. Look at what it says. It says, with a loud voice, he glorified God, and he fell down at his feet on his face, and he gives Jesus thanks. I love how the message translation puts it. It says this, one of them, when he realized that he was healed, turned around and came back, shouting his gratitude, glorifying God. He kneeled at Jesus' feet, so grateful he couldn't thank him enough. You know, thank you notes are a lost art today. Have you noticed that? Especially if you're older and you remember in those days when someone did something nice for you or gave you a gift, that was the first thing your parents made you do was sit down and you would write a handwritten, in cursive note 
and you would fold it, lick a stamp, and you would mail it to them. You remember those days? I mean, today you do something, you are lucky if you get a text with a thumbs up emoji, <laughs> you know, right? I typed this long thing, thank you so much, I'll get back, okay. <laughs> you do that to me, I'm blocking you. Right? You at least take the time to send a full sentence. Where is our gratitude? You know what I love? I love that the story didn't stop there. There's something very odd. Five simple words that almost seem out of place, maybe even a little unimportant at first glance. Those five words are this. And he was a Samaritan. It singles him out as a Samaritan. There's a reason. Okay, if you're new to the faith, Samaritans were the worst of the worst of the worst. That's why I called them Auburn fans. Okay, if you're an Alabama fan, you know I'm just teasing, sort of. This is the lowest of the low, and Jews would never, and I mean never, associate with Samaritans. It was like forbidden. They would literally go out of their way to avoid their country. Even if it meant an additional 50 miles they would cross, they would not step foot into their territory. That's how much these two detested each other, okay? So when he says he was a Samaritan, this is why I said, why are there not alarm bells going off? You've got nine Jews hanging out with a Samaritan? I don't think so. Something is that there's a reason why Jesus and Luke are telling us this story. You know what it is? Because of their circumstance, their pride was shattered. Nothing mattered. They had a common thread of misery. They had something that brought them together. Now, from time to time, I don't like us to just think of this as a 2,000 years ago story, so I like to bring it into the modern era and use today's vernacular, okay? So to help paint a picture of how out of touch these two would be, imagine if this was Cobra Kai and you've got Johnny and Daniel's son coming together to fight. That would never happen. They hate each other unless they had a common thread. Or you've got Troy and Gabriella and Sharpay. They would never hang out together unless something brought them together and they did, we're all in this together and they do their fancy song and everybody's happy. Or maybe you're a product of the 90s and this is more something that resonates with you. You would never have the cheerleader, the athlete and the nerd and the brainiac, you would never have them come together. Something's up unless Bayside needed to be united for a common purpose. Maybe you're like me. And you live through the glorious golden age of cinema, the 80s. And if that's you, then you resonate with this. And you see the criminal, the athlete, the basket case, the princess, the brain. These people could not be further apart in the real life. You went to school, you know. There are people who just didn't say hi to you, and you didn't say hi to some of them. But one Saturday, because they had all-day detention, they started out like this, and at the end, they were like this. Why? Because their common misery in detention united them and it broke down the barriers. Now do you see what is happening in this story? When you relate it to what we understand today, these 10 lepers, their common misery joined them together in a brotherhood of suffering. It shattered pride. It evened the playing field. Now, if this isn't a lesson for the modern church to stop dividing and looking for labels and treating people different because they look different than you? Or they act different? Or they have different money than you? We are one church under the gospel and the lordship of Jesus. We have no room for pride. We have no room for these divisions. And I love how this Samaritan gets singled out for this incredible point. And it says he was the only one who returned. You know what? What's the name of the leper? Yeah, right? We're not even told the guy's name. Yet here we are 2,000 years later talking about him in Apex. That's how important this person is. But there's one strange thing last I, I, want, I want to leave you with. I want you to notice that after the ten are healed, nine leave, and the only one who comes back is the one who knew Jesus the least. The one who knew religion the least. The Samaritan. Yet he was the one who experienced the healing, and came back and got the miracle of the blessing. When he says, arise, go, your faith has made you whole. When we fail to go back to God and be grateful, we miss an amazing moment with the Lord. 
What's strange to me is when he comes back, Jesus asks three questions in rapid fire. Were there not ten cleansed? Where's the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except you, <laughs> this foreigner? If you lean in, you can almost hear a ring of sadness or surprise. And Jesus is like, only one? For real? I healed ten of them. And only one comes back to say, thank you. Hmm. It's an amazing, powerful... He, he was not asking these questions because he didn't know the answer. He was asking these questions because he wanted you and I to do personal reflection so that we could look at this. This is why Luke is writing this down. See, the sad truth is so many of us have Jesus walk by every day. Sometimes we reach out to him. We had an urgent matter. Maybe we experienced a crisis and we beg God. We call out for mercy. We step out in faith and we believe. And God comes through. And after the blessing comes... We forget to say thanks. We forget to humble ourselves in gratitude like this one did. And we move on. We don't mean to go with the other nine, but that's just what happened because life got in the way and we weren't people of gratitude. Look at what Jesus' response is. The last thing he says, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. At first, I looked at that, I'm like, oh, cool, look at that, he's talking about his healing, he's, he doesn't have leprosy anymore, he can actually hug people, he doesn't stink, his nose is back, and no, 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 look deeper. When you actually look in the original Greek, he uses a verb here that is rendered out, your faith has made you whole. But here's what's amazing to me, the actual Koine Greek word used here translates directly as your faith is now saving you. But it's the same verb usage that is used when you experience salvation. Do you catch what's happening? It wouldn't surprise me at all, knowing Jesus, that he was far less concerned about just surface healing than he was about spiritual healing. And this seems to imply, when you read in the original language, that God is healing not only his body, but his spirit. And there's Jesus meeting all our needs all the time when we humble ourselves and come with a heart of gratitude. Clearly, Jesus is happy with his attitude. Clearly, Jesus is pleased when we bring a heart full of humility and gratitude. Do we really grasp that important message? Here's what we're going to do. I want to close with this story. And afterwards, we're just going to open up the altar just for a minute for you to come and just say thank you to God. No one will bother you. You can stand where you are. We like to sing one last song, and then we're done. But I want to share something that is so powerful, story of gratitude. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and invite our instrumentalists to go ahead and come back and get in place. Many of you remember Max Lucado. Before he was a famous pastor over here in America, he was a teacher at a university in Brazil. And while he was teaching in one of the poorest parts of Brazil, he shares a true story. When he was walking through the street on his way to university, he feels a tug on his pant leg. And when he turns around, he sees this. A five- or six-year-old boy with a dirt-smudged face who holds out his hands and says just two words, bread, sir, bread, sir. That's it. Now, honestly, Max says there are so many people who do this, you literally cannot help them all. So the inclination is to not even go there. But he said this day, something compelled him about this little boy, and he couldn't turn away. So Max Lucado took the little boy's hand, and he said, come with me. And he took him into a nearby coffee shop, and he went up to the owner, and he says, I will have a cup of coffee, and I want you to give this boy anything he wants. Charge it to me. Max thought that would be the end of it. The coffee counter was at the far end of the shop, so he walked away thinking that was the last he'd see the boy, because honestly, most people he's helped out grab the bread, and they run out the door. And he's thinking, why would this be any different? Until he's standing with his back at the coffee counter, and he feels eyes boring into him. And he turns around and he sees the boy has not left, but the boy is standing there just staring at the bread. Max is a tall man, and he said, I looked down at the boy, and as I turned to look at him, slowly his eyes came up until they met mine. There he was holding his pastry in one hand, and he looked up and he said, thank you, sir. Thank you very much very much. And he turned and left. 
Max Licato said, I was so touched by this boy's gratitude that in that moment, I would have bought him the entire store if he'd only asked. His gratitude moved me so much that I just sat down for another half hour. I missed the class that I was supposed to be teaching at university, and I just thought about the impact of a little beggar boy who I don't even know his name, the only one who came back and said, thank you. And there it is. Your truth grenade to take with you. The God of the universe who needs nothing delights in your thanks. The God of the universe who lacks for nothing is still moved when his children show gratitude. Still moved when say, Father, thank you. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you that I woke up this morning. Thank you that my family is even here. Thank you. You could go on and on and on in this attitude of gratitude. I promise it will change your perspective. See, it's Thanksgiving, and a lot of us are fine with Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is good, but the challenge from last week is thanks living is better. Thanksgiving is great, but thanks living is better. I pray this season as we go through these streets, as we go through the malls, as we run into people who are just so frazzled and tired and beat up, I pray they would see gratitude in our heart. They would see there's something different about us, that we don't just go in and complain like everybody else. And maybe they see that difference and they say, hey, there's something different about you. What's up? And you can tell them, <laughs> it's not me. Let me tell you about Jesus. You have that open door. I want to be this guy here that says, and with a loud voice, he glorified God, fell down on his face, and gave him thanks. So that's our challenge this week. To be the one who has a heart of gratitude, who is humble not afraid to associate with those who are different and give the Lord thanks. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word, for the power of the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of our heart so that these aren't just more words on the page, but they are living. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to know you as our Father and not leaving us as distant, faraway orphans, Lord, but you've provided a way back into your presence through the Son through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus, the innocent Lamb of God who did nothing wrong yet took our sin. God, I thank you for that. We receive that. Holy Spirit, invade our life. Take control. Show us a better way. Help us to live with purpose and passion. Help us to be like your son, to bring light and love into every room we walk into. And above all, God, receive our thanks. Look at our hearts and see the gratitude we have. In Jesus' name.